I, uh, <clears throat> the last cruise ship we were on, I noticed there was a guy, he was there, he was all by himself all week, and I'd, I heard him talk, so I knew he wasn't from Arkansas, he was from England, and um, so anyway, we just kind of lounging around in the uh, promenade area, and he was sitting there drinking some tea, so I went over and sat down by him, I said, you're from England, aren't you? We talked a little bit, and, you know, he's like, yeah, how did you know? I said, well, I can hear your talk, you know. And he said that uh, he liked, he used to be in the armed forces, and um, he liked going to all these exotic places, trekking through the jungle, you know, and he was probably getting close to 70 years old. And uh, so we talked a little bit, and I shook his hand. I said, God save the queen. And his eyes lit up like that. He said, thank you. It, most people in England love the monarchy. They absolutely, they love their queen. And I don't have a problem with that, and I don't mind saying that because of what I know. This Bible is protected, Okay. It is protected, it is not copyrighted outside of the United Kingdom. You can print it and reprint it all you want to. But in the United Kingdom and all their different territories, it's different. When King James translated or had this book translated, when he received it, he placed it under what's called the Royal Letters Patent. In other words, it's patented, copyrighted, under the authority. He did not put his name to it. He put it under the monarchy's rule. So that even after he died, whoever became king or queen after his death still held the patent to this Bible. So, in the late 1800s, I uh, can't remember who was king at the time, but he commissioned Oxford University and Cambridge University, which are the two patent holders to the, to the King's Bible. He petitioned them to undertake the work of updating the language from the King's Bible. In other words, replace thee, thou, and so on. Okay? And I'm here to tell you, Every time somebody says, we're just updating the language, it never ends up that way. They always ruin the Bible. Because the two people that the king put in charge of this work were Westcott and Hort. Those are the two men who, after years of translating the Bible from the Greek Textus Receptus, or even the majority text, 5,000 Greek manuscripts, and they all say almost the same thing. Westcott and Hort decided that all of those manuscripts were wrong, and that the Vaticanus manuscript and the Mount Sinai manuscript, even though those two Greek manuscripts disagreed with each other over 3,000 times just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They decided that those were more accurate than the Greek text that King James was translated from. So when the king gave them the responsibility of updating the language, they went way outside of the scope of what the king wanted. So what they wanted to do was completely retranslate the Bible using these other two Greek manuscripts and abandoning all those majority manuscripts. And that's what they did. So that's what you get. Their, their product was the revised standard version. That's the one that says in Isaiah, a young woman shall conceive. Instead of a virgin shall conceive. So when the king saw it, I'm not sure exactly of the history on this. I just know that it was never used to replace the King James Bible because it was significantly different 
than the King James. So they just decided to give it its own title. It is now the Revised Standard Version or the Revised Version. And we'll just leave the King's Bible the way it is. Amen. So I had a man in um, Nottingham, England. He used to call me. His name was Barry. And the phone would ring and I'd pick it up and he'd say, Mike, it's Barry from England. And I'm going, yeah, I know it. <laughs> He was a dear old man and he loved the Lord. And I would listen to this man talk about the King James Bible. He'd be weeping. And his personal ministry was to collect sermons from various preachers that preached about the King James Bible and then distribute those to whoever wanted them. And he sat down and he made up a dictionary based upon, only upon, the usage of the word from the King James Bible. Gail Ripplinger ended up using that dictionary in one of her books on the King James issue. Uh, I had not heard from him in years, so I assume he's gone on to be with the Lord. And I said to him, in one conversation, I said, well, you know, the King James is not copyrighted anywhere. He said, Mike, that's not true. And I'm going, oh, no. And he said, it's under the Royal Letters Patent. And I was angry because I thought, yes, they messed with the Bible. They copyrighted it. He said, no, Mike, you don't understand. He said, there was a court case where the Sodomites sued Oxford and Cambridge. The two universities that administer the rights to the King James Bible. And he said, they sued it to have the word Sodomite taken out of that Bible. Because it said it made them look bad. Of course, their gay pride parades do that for them, okay? They lost the case. The courts could not even overrule the monarchy in this situation. They lost the case because they said, since that Bible is under the royal letters patent, it cannot be altered except by the monarch. Only the king or the queen can authorize a change because it is their Bible. And I went, God, that's pretty smart. He's pretty wise. Now, outside of the UK, you can copy it. You can reprint it. You can change it if you want to. Outside of the United Kingdom, but inside of England... You must get permission from Oxford or Cambridge University. You must get permission from them to print it or to use quotations from it. Or if you're going to alter it, which they'll never grant you permission to alter it because they don't even have permission. The king or the queen is the only one. So when I told this man, God save the queen, his eyes lit up like that. And I told him, I said, I like you guys. I'm not, we're not at war with each other anymore. And I said, your queen is protecting my Bible. So next time you see her, tell her I appreciate it. <laughs> so anyway, isn't that great? Amen. God's protecting his word. He's not going to let it. It's incorruptible. Cannot be altered. Cannot be changed. Ephesians chapter 6. Turn there, please. Ephesians chapter 6. Let me get back here. We're dealing with uh, principalities and powers. We're, the work of devils is what we're dealing with. Well, I didn't know it was this far back. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 6. My goodness. Where is it in my notes? Here it is. Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Verse 11. We'll read this. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Appreciate everybody being here. Appreciate those of you online. Pray for those that are home and sick and could not be here tonight. Ephesians chapter 6 four and 11. Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I was with Lisa in the, in the hospital. She was waiting to go home that Saturday when the news broke about that synagogue shooting. And so we were kind of had the TV on, we was watching the news, and of course they replay the footage, you know, over and over and over again while they're talking. 
And I remember there was a man who was, he was obviously a sniper. And he got his instructions on where to go. And you see him walking down into the danger zone with his sniper rifle. He's got a backpack as big as that pulpit on his back. He's got every pocket that he's got full of something. He's probably carrying close to 100 pounds worth of gear. Okay? And he's, I'm sure he's wearing, you know, bulletproof vest. He is protected as well as he can be protected, but still do what he's been called to do. I said the word Jew. That must be in my mind. But anyway, undoubtedly, he was going to climb up in some sort of position. And he was going to stay there. And if need be, put a bullet in whoever was doing all that shooting. Okay? He had on as much as he possibly could carry. I'm sure that once he got in position, he would have asked for more to cover him. But if you're told to put on the whole armor of God and you leave something out, if I'm your enemy, where am I going to aim? I'm going to aim right there. So you ponder that. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to, able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins go to battle with truth. So if you forget truth, that's where the devil's going to aim. The breastplate of righteousness. If you forget that, that's where your enemy is going to aim at you. He's going to aim. Watch this now. When you put on your own righteousness, you're not bulletproof. You're not fiery dart proof. He will aim at your self-righteousness every single time. Which is why we don't adorn with our own righteousness. We put on Christ's righteousness. Amen. I read an article by a Church of Christ pastor. And in this article he said, It is absolutely ridiculous to think that we are adorned with Christ's righteousness. That's what he said. See, they believe in you must be baptized in their water and you must be baptized to be saved. And it was all about how you must adorn yourself with your righteousness. Mm -mm -mm. That man's got an awakening coming. They all do. So anyway, having your loins girt about breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Leave that out. Where does Jesus attack? We talked about this morning. Where does Jesus attack the image? On his toes. Okay? So cover up your feet. Feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. To me, that's... I wouldn't say that any of these are less important. But this shield of faith right here, you must have that. And what that is... Is that you say that you believe everything the Bible says. And if the Bible doesn't say it, you don't believe it. You're not required to. You don't have to. But if the Bible doesn't say it specifically in no uncertain terms, you don't believe it. You don't fall for it. But if it does say it, you better believe it. The fiery darts are being hurled at all manner of people. Those fiery darts are meant to destroy those who say they are believers. So when you have a shield of absolute faith and trust in this book, he will not be able to destroy you. He, those darts will never make it through. So let me just kind of throw this out to you for a minute. Is there something in the Bible... That you've never really understood 
and it's sort of a question in your mind because you don't understand it and maybe sometimes you struggle with it. Anything like that. All right. So here's what I'm going to tell you. And I, I've made this statement before. I'll, I'll do it until I die. Just believe the words. Just believe them. Maybe you don't understand, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You may not understand how all that works, but don't worry about it. As long as you believe what it says. Way too many errors are made when people try to make sense out of the Godhead. And I've, I've read things that just, I just shake my head. I'm going, why do people believe this? Some will say that it's not really a Godhead. There's not really three. There's only one. Well, that's not what it says. Some will say that it's like three different gods. That's not what it says. Okay. Whenever, whenever somebody tries to make it make sense, I promise you they're going to divert away from the, from what it says and what it means. So if you will just believe the words, that's your protection. Because somebody will say something and you'll go, uh-uh, that ain't what the Bible says. Doesn't say it. Doesn't say it. And on this, a lot of issues, plus, now I'm in the flat earth business. People will come at me and they say, Mike, it's all in the Bible. If it is, why haven't you told me what verses to look at? If it's really there, tell me where to open it up and look, and then I'll look, I'll look at it myself. What's all through there? No. You're going to have to be more specific than that, because now you're lying. Either ignorantly or willingly, you're not being honest. Tell me the verse. I need two of them. Tell me the verses where it says this flat. Okay? And they're not there. So don't believe it. Don't believe it. But if, if the Bible said that the sky is really purple, if that's what the Bible said, I wouldn't disagree with it. I may wonder why it said that, but I'd have to believe it. Okay? Here's what I'm finding out. The Bible is not contradictory to most science. It's not. The Bible actually says it right. And every now and then the scientists catch up with the Bible. Every now and then they'll get something right. And you'll see, and you'll see it's been in the Bible for thousands of years. Like the book, the DNA. That's been there all this time. 3,000 years David wrote that. And now in the age where we can understand what DNA is, you look at that verse and you're going, that's DNA. I mean, it doesn't contradict what DNA is in any way, shape, or form. In fact, it, it tells you from the Bible standpoint what it really is. It's a book that God wrote. So even if you don't understand a verse or two out of the Bible, believe it. Believe the words. Believe the way it's written. Don't try to retranslate it. Amen? Just leave it alone. Believe it. That's your shield. And that shield is movable. You can, you can block and guard and put it down here if you need to or come around the back behind with you or whatever. Where was I? Take the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Father, Lord, I pray you'd bless your word tonight. Give us light. Give us understanding. Lord, help us to see the world around us the way it really is. And Lord, teach us some great and mighty things, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said... All right, now I got to get back all the way over here. And this thing don't flip fast. So in Ephesians chapter 5 there, while I'm doing this, Ephesians chapter 5, we talked about there's four types of devils. Because we're learning about devils. There's four groups of devils. Now there's one group right there. Okay? Four groups of devils. You have principalities. They deal with what? Principalities, what do they deal with? Any type of authority. 
Say authority, John. Okay, there you go. Authority. Every place you are, you are under authority. Okay, there is no place where you're not under somebody's authority or rule. There's laws everywhere to govern mankind. So we talked about that. That's the first group. Second group are called powers. All right. These are the working of devils through human agents, causing them to have supernatural powers. Does it, is it really true? Can people using powers perform supernatural events? What say you? John's the only guy saying yes here. Thank you, Ron. John and Ron. Can people using powers perform supernatural events? Can somebody using these devils predict the future and be right? Okay. There's two possibilities. Either the devils who I believe have a limited ability to see into the future, either they saw something that was going to happen and told somebody before it happened, or they fed some guy a bunch of stuff about a train wreck that was going to happen at 12 noon the next day at a certain place, and the devils caused the train wreck. To make this guy look like he's, boy, he really knows some things. And I've, I've seen advertisements for psychics and for diviners and all of these types of people. And they all talk about how amazingly accurate they are with their predictions. They don't tell you how many times they've been wrong. But they will tell you how many times they've been right. And it's been a lot of times. But we know the rule. Even at that, if they're wrong one time, they didn't come from God. And God will not let powers be right 100% of the time turn to um, turn to Revelation 13 Revelation 13 let's get a, a picture of where all this is going the purpose of powers and I want you to think of it like this principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness high places they're all they all have a common goal and that is to enthrone the beast to set up his kingdom you have four groups how many parts to the image that did nebuchadnezzar see four okay so th that's part of it so in revelation 13 verse 11 i beheld another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon and he exercised with all the power of the first beast before him so he's got power doesn't he all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. This false prophet has powers. He has the ability to call down fire from heaven to earth and men see it and they go, he's got powers. How many people throughout history have done magic tricks or really have tapped into satanic powers to work certain miracles only to mislead thousands of people against the gospel? How much of that goes on in the Catholic Church? In order for you to be a bona fide saint of the Catholic Church, you must have two verified miracles that are from you. You must, you must work at least two verified miracles before they will recognize you as a saint. Okay? So, I believe that happens. Turn to Deuteronomy. 13, no, 
Deuteronomy. Yeah, Deuteronomy 13. Deuteronomy 13. Verse 1. There arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder come to pass. So is it possible that people can work miracles based upon powers that they received from devils? There are, every time there is an appearance of the Virgin Mary, there's always miracles surrounding that. There's always people that are healed. There's always people that are crippled. And all of a sudden they walk. Blind people can now see. Deaf people can hear. That happens all over the world. It's been happening for years. And probably still does. There are... there. I can't remember exactly the details, but I remember one statue of Mary literally had blood drops coming... From her eyes. Like she's crying blood. And everybody goes, Oh, Santa Maria! Santa Maria! That means Saint Mary. And all of those convince those people that those miracles are from God and they worship the statue. They'll come for thousands of miles just to be able to touch that statue. And hopefully that healing will fall upon them or that miracle will fall upon them or whatever. The Shroud of Turin. They pull it out every so often, let everybody look at it. People say, oh, I was looking at the Shroud and I was contemplating the mystery of Christ and all of a sudden I could walk or I could hear or I could see. Miracles like that happening. Why does God let those things happen? Because he tells you in Deuteronomy, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So this guy does miracles. And then it says, let us go after these other gods, St. Mary, St. Joseph, St. Catherine. All these saints are gods. Let's go after these gods. And God said, I sent them to test you. Because if you're going to fall for something like that, you're not my child. And you don't love me because I told you don't bow down to idols and don't go after other gods. There's always going to be a trial of man's faith. And these devils are part of that. So the working of devils through human agents, causing them to have powers such as, what is ESP? It's not a sports network. What is it? Extra sensory perception. We have five senses. Taste, touch, Smell and see. Messed you up, didn't I? <laughs> Taste, touch, smell, hear, and see. Five. Anybody who has a sixth sense, they claim that they can perceive what's going on in somebody's mind. Or they can, believe it or not, police agencies will hire these people. And they'll give them a bullet and say, can you sense where this bullet came from? And they'll close their eyes and they'll get in contact with some spirit. Oh yeah, I see it. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm at the murder scene now. I see the guy with the gun. And they'll do that and they'll get paid for this. Extrasensory perception. Telekinesis. What is that? Huh? Moving objects with your mind. Okay? Uh, I can... If I had a way to illustrate this, I might... No, I wouldn't do it. I can move pencils without touching them. Okay? But it's a trick. I learned it. I use fool people. Telepathy. What is that? Mind reading. Divination. Okay. All of these work together. They're called the occult practices. And God said, don't do them. Turn to Deuteronomy 18. 
Deuteronomy 18. God hates the devils that do these things. He hates them. They're going to be judged, but they're serving a purpose right now. Are they not? Do you believe that in churches all over the world, there's phony Christians? False brethren? Sure. And this is one of the ways, what we saw, what we saw there in Deuteronomy 13, these are some of the ways that God uses to filter out the false brethren. Because if they're not really saved, almost without fail, they will bring in, at least to themselves, some form of power that God said don't have. Don't have anything to do with it. We had some young ladies that came to our school. Remember the Flaith girls? Remember them? Flaith? Y'all were young. But her mom, his four daughters, brought them over here to put in our school. Okay, four kids. Man, that's pretty good income, you know. So I took them. They were here all of like a month. And I kicked them all out. They went around telling everybody that their mom was actually a witch and she would do spell casting with the girls. And one of the girls took some of the other girls into the girls' bathroom, turned the light out, and was doing some conjuring there in the bathroom. And I found out about it. I called their mom and I said, you're a witch, aren't you? Why, no, I don't, what, you know, and I said, well, that's what your daughters are saying. Your daughters are over here telling everybody here that you do spell casting at home and, and you practice witchcraft and she denied it and I said well based upon what I've seen already I think your girls are incompatible with our school come and get them I didn't put up with it not for a second I'm not on a witch hunt okay but I knew I knew the spirit that was here when those girls showed up and it took me a while but I said I'm not doing that here no way know how okay she claimed to be a christian she claimed to be a christian but i am convinced that those girls were telling the truth that they knew their mama was spell casting okay deuteronomy 18 9 when thou art coming to the land which the lord thy god giveth thee thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations god said don't learn their ways so what did israel do Learned their ways. The moment you tell a child, see that box over there? Whatever you do, don't open that box. Because if you do, I'm going to whip you to within an inch of your life. And then I'm going to whip the other inch. And all you need to do is walk out and give them a chance. They're going to look in that box. Why? Because you told them not to. God told Israel, and God knew this, God told Israel, don't learn their ways, knowing that that's exactly what they're going to do. And believe it or not, that Jewish synagogue where those people got shot, they are conservative Jews, meaning they practice the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. Jewish mystic and the name, does anybody know what the name of the temple was? Tree of Life. Do you know Why? The tree of life is a Kabbalah term and it rep and they have a tree figure that has all these circles and all these lines going to it. And those circles represent 10 divine beings. The lines represent pathways that you must go through and you must join with these beings. And half of this tree is masculine and the other half is feminine. So it's not the tree of life. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the temple. And these people to, to this day have incorporated these practices into Judaism. And they, they do not know that they're doing wrong. They're blinded in part. So verse 10, there should not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Or that useth divination. 
Divination is palm reading. Uh, reading tea leaves in the bottom of a kettle or a cup. Uh, pig entrails or goat entrails. They'll kill a, a goat or something like that and pull out its entrails. And whoever is um, good at reading those signs, they say they can divine the future by the entrails of that goat or whatever. Ugh. I'd hate that job. Amen. Uh, can I work my way up to something better than this? I don't like getting that on my hands. All right. But anyway, divination. Uh, any, any way of trying to predict the future. Anyway. Whether it's astrology, palm reading, um, entrail reading, or uh, whatever. There's many, many different forms of divination. Who knows another one? Tarot cards. That's cardomancy. And tarot cards have now become so mainstream, most of these games that kids play involve... There's a game called Card Captors. And it's all about pulling out certain cards and Dungeons and Dragons was based upon cards and different things like that. It's cardomancy. It's divination. Who had another one? Astrology. Okay, that is... Under the observer of times. Okay, but it works. It's still divination. Give me another one. Palm reading. Huh? Ball gazing. That's called um, scrying. You use a crystal ball or you use a bowl full of mercury. Or a, a bowl of water. Or you can go to a pond or a lake. Anything where there's a reflection in the water. And, and get this, you're trying to make contact with a spirit that's under the water. Dun, dun, dun. That's Revelation 13. Okay? That's what they're doing. Um, who else? Yeah, getting energy from crystals. That would be, that may be divination. Okay? Somebody else? Psychometry. What about it? Tell me about this. Psychometry is when you take, uh, like, an inkpen or someone's purse or the glasses or whatever, you get energies off of that, supposedly, and you can tell them what happened in the past. It even predicts the future. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, I've, I've heard of that, didn't know it was called psychometry. Automatic writing. Oh, let me tell you a story. Automatic writing. You lay out a big piece of paper and a pen, and you go into a trance, and you get in contact with a spirit. And the spirit then will control your hand as you start writing. Um, what's the game, the board game? Ouija board. Do not play with Ouija boards, ever. If you have one, burn it. Don't sell it in the yard sale, burn it. Those are dangerous. They're very evil. And they're on sale for Christmas. I guarantee you, you'll find them on sale. But automatic writing, you go into a trance, the spirit guides your hand, and you're writing out all kinds of things. There's been dozens of books on the occult written by spirits through the hand of of a person. Okay? Now think about that. The opposite of that is holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay? Paul still had his free will. Paul still had his consciousness when he dictated the letter to Timothy. He was fully awake and fully aware. And he had his secretary, because Paul couldn't see very well, so he had somebody write it out for him. And he told them the words. Paul would not go in a trance. He just, the words just came to him. They were given to him by the Holy Ghost. Paul said, write this down. He wrote it down. And we have the letter to 1 Timothy. The reason why I spent a little time on this is that there's a, a TV show on some of these Christian networks called It's Supernatural. And this guy features 
some of the wackiest, devil-inspired people who claim they're Christians. One guy in particular, he says that if you, you need to learn how to hear from God. Because you don't know how to hear from God. And I'm going, yeah, I do. I read my Bible. Well, this guy said he went through a, a time in his life where he, he knew he wasn't hearing anything from God. And he wondered why. So he said God taught him how to hear from God. And what it is, you go into a trance. You go into a trance, a meditative trance. You empty your mind out completely. And then you find out that the God you're wanting to speak to is actually on the inside of you. So you start communing with this thing in you. And this thing is going to give you words. And this guy said, write them down. And he said, that's God's word for you today. It's a replacement. It's an addition to what's in the Bible. Uh, what was his name? Mark? Ver, huh? No. Uh, Verkler. I think it's something like that. Now, I've talked about him on Pastor Mike Online. And he's been on there several times, but he is endorsing this form of automatic writing. Only he says you're getting it from God. And so what you end up with is God's word for you. It's a personal word from God for you. Which is a lie. Because when God speaks to us, he does it through his mediator, Jesus Christ. And this is the same guy who had a guy on saying that he went to heaven and had all these books in God's library. And he reached over to take one. He was going to take it with him. And Jesus said, you can't have that one. And it was John 22. There's only 21 chapters in John. And this guy claimed that there was an extra chapter to the Gospel of John in a book in heaven. And Jesus said, well, you can't take it to earth now because they're not ready for it. But I'm going to bring you back up here and I'll give you that book and then you can bring it down to the earth. And I'm going, that matches what Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, bring you any other gospel. And that's the end of the gospel. John 21 is the end of the gospels. This guy has one chapter addition to the four gospels. That's another gospel. And Paul said, let it be accursed. So these practices are being done inside Christianity. Forms of divination. Trying to discern. Whoa, God, oh, God's giving me a, a word right now. Oh, God's giving me a vision. Okay. And he's all these people with these all private words that supposedly God gave them. Private visions, private prophecies, write, writing these things down so you don't forget them. And that's your word of God for today. And the devil's just laughing. Because he is successfully moving into the church environment in this country. He's being welcomed with open arms. These practices are being done. Inside of a building that they said was God's house. And it's an abomination. Okay? So, there's a reason why we don't do certain things here. There's a reason why I won't allow certain things here. Because if I find out that somebody is practicing these things. And is a part of this church. I'm going to have to deal with it. Because we, just like I dealt with that family. When I found out mama was home spellcasting with those girls, out. You're not going to put your little agents inside my school. It's not going to happen. We didn't get into the rest of it. An observer of times, that is astrology. And we'll talk about that as we go on. An enchanter, which is vain repetitions. A witch, there's witchcraft being done. A charmer. Uh, using little charms and things like that. They say, they say have power, consult with familiar spirits, a wizard, a necromancer. All, these, all that do these things are an abomination of the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. God's still a jealous God, amen?
Stand to your feet or I'll talk all night. Act like you're going to get out and walk out on me. God is still a jealous God. He wants you pure with Him. Because God knows the spirits that are behind these practices. And He knows that they're evil. And He knows that they are very destructive. And once you start practicing these things, they're going to play nice for a while. And then at some point, they're going to turn on the evil against you. And they're going to consume you. And God knows this. He's not just saying, don't do this because it's, I don't like it. God knows the danger behind it. Um, I've had you stand up. I better let you go. Next week, bring me a story that you know of where somebody used a Ouija board or something like that and things turned bad. Okay? I won't do it tonight, but next Sunday night, I want to hear some of your stories because I, I'll believe them because I got a few of my own. Okay, go home, go through your closets. If you find a Ouija board, burn it. You people online, I'm dead serious. Those things are evil. Amen. But if you think about it, those were the first computers with a mouse. Click, click. Yeah, it's wireless mouse. <laughs>